Good afternoon. My name is Alyssa Banford, and I am the Director of Civic Engagement for the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis. I would like to welcome you to Commemorating King in St. Louis, a program that has been co-developed by the Newmark Institute for Human Relations of the Jewish Community Relations Council and the Missouri Historical Society. We are excited for you to join us virtually. Thank you for being here. This will be a roughly 60 minute presentation and it is being recorded. So if you would like to view it again or share this presentation with others, it will be posted on both the Missouri Historical Society and the JCRC YouTube channels by the end of the week. Your feedback is always important to us. We would really appreciate if you would answer a few questions for us after the program. A Kobo toolbox survey will soon open in another tab in your browser. So keep an eye out for that when you leave this session. With that, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Francis Levine, president of the Missouri Historical Society. Thank you so much, Alyssa, and welcome. On November 27th, 1960, Dr. King traveled to St. Louis and he spoke at United Hebrew Temple which is now the reading room to the Missouri Historical Society's Library and Research Center. We'd love to be able to welcome you today to that space, and we will once it's, we're able to do it. But today, we'll share some images and videos that capture the essence of this space and the day Dr. King spoke. This year's theme for the annual MLK celebration is the urgency of creating the beloved community. And we know that coming together as a community around our shared humanity is imperative today. It's an honor to commemorate the 60th anniversary alongside the Newmark Institute for Human Relations of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And many thanks for this collaboration. I know that some of you are watching who are Missouri Historical Society members. Thank you. We're grateful for your support. And if you're not a member, We'd love for you to consider joining us. We also sincerely thank the city and county residents for your tax contributions through the Zoo Museum tax, tax District that allows us to host so many wonderful programs. So thank you so much, Alyssa. I'm turning it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And now I would like to introduce Rabbi Howard Koplansky, Rabbi Emeritus from United Hebrew Congregation and past president of the Newmark Institute for Human Relations. Speaking as, as the first chairman of the Michael and Barbara Newmark Institute for Human Relations, which is committed to the concept of a pluralistic society where diverse religious, racial, and ethnic groups live and work together as their differences enhance the community and as a past president of the Jewish Community Relations Council of, of St. Louis, we feel deeply honored to participate in, in this commemoration of the life and transformative work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I speak also as the Rabbi Emeritus of United Hebrew Congregation, the oldest Jewish congregation west of the Mississippi, which will be celebrating its 100 84th birthday this November. And, uh, over almost two centuries, we have gathered many artifacts and symbols of our proud history. But only one of those symbols is placed in the center of our bima, our pulpit, as a badge of pride one day each year, as a statement of what we as a congregation hold up as representative of the prophetic ideal that guides us in our relationship with God and humanity. What is that symbol? A chair. It is not just any chair. It is a red leather reclining chair in which an exhausted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr sat as he was resting before he was to speak at the liberal forum sponsored by the Jewish Community Center of St. Louis held at United Hebrew Congregation. 
in the sanctuary of the building, as was mentioned, that is now the Library and Research Center of the Missouri Historical Society. Dr. King fell asleep in that chair. But from our Bema, Dr. King filled our sanctuary with energy and his words of inspiration, prophetic words that still motivate us to continue his work. And we place that chair on our Bema to remind us of the messenger and his message that inspires the work of the Michael and Barbara Newmark Institute for Human Relations, the Jewish Community Relations Council, United Hebrew Congregation, and thankfully, so many others. Thank you, Rabbi Kaplansky. At this time, I would like to introduce Chris Gordon, Missouri Historical Society's Director of Library and Collection, who at this moment is joining us from inside the reading room at the Library and Research Center, which is formerly the United Hebrew Congregation. And he is going to share a bit more about the history of this building and what it's like to currently work inside. Thank you, Alyssa. And hello from the reading room of the Missouri Historical Society's Library and Research Center. I'm Christopher Allen Gordon, Director of Library and Collections for the Missouri Historical Society. In this facility at 225 South Skinker, when items are not on display over at the museum, they are housed in this building. And we have over 175,000 objects, over a million photographs and prints, over 90,000 volumes of library material, thousands of maps, sound and moving image collections, and millions of documents. And it's also in this building where you can come if you have a historical interest such as genealogy, house or neighborhood history, or just any interest in St. Louis history, the history of early Missouri, or the American West, and you can meet with our staff of archivists and librarians, and they can assist you with that research. But while this is a, now a great library, as you've heard, this building actually began its life as the United Hebrew Congregation Synagogue. And 94 years ago, this month, in 1927, Rabbi Samuel Thurman dedicated this building with these words. The United Hebrew Congregation is entering upon a period which shall see its highest ideals and most cherished hopes realized, for it has erected a most beautiful and commodious new house of God. And this truly is an amazing and beautiful building. Indeed, the United Hebrew Congregation Temple served as the home of generations of families who worshiped, celebrated, and carried on the rich traditions of Jewish life in St. Louis. And along the way, the building itself became historical. Rabbi Thurman served as the spiritual head of this congregation for over 40 years. He was a community leader, and he was also actually a, a close personal friend of President Harry S. Truman. So much so that he delivered a benediction prayer at Truman's 1948 presidential inauguration. So there is much history in this building, but we are here today for one, to remember one his, uh, extraordinary event. In 1960, the Liberal Forum invited Dr. Martin, Le excuse me, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to St. Louis to speak. Although the speech was scheduled to be delivered at the JCCA's usual location in the Central West End, the organizers were worried that uh, it couldn't accommodate such a large crowd. And so the United Hebrew Congregation's rabbi, Jerome Thurman, uh, Jerome Grohlman, invited Dr. King and the group to speak at the United Hebrew Congregation Temple. So on November 27, 1960, 
Dr. King spoke before 2,300 people in this room. And he told them of how, uh, he told them about the future of integration and how Southern politicians and groups like the KKK, how they were working to block integration and undermine voting rights for black Americans across the South. And Dr. King talked about how he was committed and his uh, civil rights leaders were committed to practicing nonviolent forms of resistance to overcome and uh, that those attempts uh, in the South. Today, there's a plaque here in the reading room that memorializes the event. It stands as a reminder of this important page in St. Louis history. In 1989, the Missouri Historical Society purchased the building from the congregation. It restored the original interior of this room, just as it was on that November day in 1960 when Dr. King spoke here. And I know that I speak for everyone who enters this building each day when I say that we are proud to call this building our place of work and we honor its history. Right now, the library is closed to the public due to this pandemic. But once things are better and we reopen, we invite you to visit this beautiful and historic building. Like the museum, it is free and it is open to the general public. So thank you and we hope to see you at the Missouri Historical Society's Library and Research Center. Thank you so much, Chris. And to reiterate Chris's point, the Library and Research Center is absolutely worth a visit. So, it's worth saying also that November 27th, 1960 was not the only time that Dr. King visited St. Louis. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Shakia Gillette, Director of African American History Initiative at the Missouri Historical Society. Shakia will give a brief overview of the handful of times that Dr. King actually spoke here in St. Louis. Shakia? Thank you, Alyssa, for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Throughout the years, the work of Dr. King has resonated deeply in St. Louis. Prior to his death, Dr. King visited St. Louis several times. His first appearance was on April 10th, 1957, when he spoke in front of 8,000 people at the Keele Auditorium, the current location of the Enterprise Center. During this visit, he stated, then my friends, we must face the fact that segregation is still a reality in America. We still confront it in the South in its glaring and conspicuous forms. We still confront it in the North, in the border states, in its hidden and subtle forms. This occasion followed the success of the year long Montgomery bus boycott. Here he announced that segregation was on its deathbed. He spoke again on December 4th, 1957 for the General Assembly of the National Council of Churches at the Keele Opera House. King wanted to do more to desegregate churches and gave a speech on his faith to the South in aid for the social transition into integrated religious spaces. King delivered the future of integration on November 27th, 1960 at the United Hebrew Temple the current location of the Missouri Historical Society's Library and Research Center. On May 28, 1963, King spoke at Washington Tab Tabernacle Baptist Church, the church of his childhood best friend, Reverend Earl Nance Sr. This speech was a part of a nationwide tour, building up momentum for his I Have a Dream speech. He spoke of selfless love, agape love, on September 20th, 1963, at Temple Israel to over 3,000 people on the Shabbat between Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. King spoke again on March 28th, 1964 at Washington Tabernacle, and his final St. Louis appearance was on October 12th, 1964 at St. Louis University. Here, 
King declared, while the law can't change the hearts of men, it does change the habits. And in time, habits change attitudes. Two days later, King earned the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize. We are proud to have this direct tie to Dr. King and happy to honor his legacy with you today. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that history, Shakia. Now we are going to hear from MHS oral historian, Julia, Julia Lasher, who recently worked with a St. Louisan who is among the audience when Dr. King spoke to the United Hebrew Congregation in 1960. Julia? Thank you, Alyssa. So as Alyssa said, we are going to be watching some clips from an oral history I conducted with Benjamin Uchatel in October of 2020. Some of you may recognize Ben as a former mayor of Clayton. So this was a remote oral history that we did over Zoom due to the pandemic. As you will hear Ben say in this first clip, he was a young father in 1960 and had just moved to St. Louis with his family in 1959 to begin a career as a lawyer. So let's hear what he has to say. This is an oral history interview for the Missouri Historical Society with Mr. Benjamin Uchatel. And my name is Julia Lasher and I'm the oral historian at the Missouri Historical Society. So my first question for you, Mr. Uchatel, we'll just start at the very beginning. Can we start by saying, uh, call me Ben rather than Mr. Yushitel? Yeah, of course we can. <laughs> Good. Um, so Ben, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, basically uh, Great Neck, New York on August 22nd, 1933. That makes me 87 years of age. And jumping forward or backwards, back on, in November 27th, 1960, when Martin Luther King came to speak. Uh, that was 60 years ago, from 60, yeah, 60 years ago. So 87 minus 60, I was 27 years of age. So in the next clip that we're going to watch, uh, Ben discusses the United Hebrew Congregation. So at this time, United Hebrew was one of the largest congregations in the United States. And you'll also hear Ben mention Rabbi Grohlman. So this is Rabbi Jerome W. Grohlman, who was one of those instrumental in bringing Dr. King to speak in 1960. He was rabbi at United Hebrew from 1948 until 1990. And he was a prominent civil rights leader in his own right. He went on to march with Dr. King in 1963 at the March on Washington and again in 1965 on the march from Selma to Montgomery. I wanted to ask you about United Hebrew Temple during this time. So did you become members of that congregation? We were members of United Hebrew, uh, or my wife was a member of United Hebrew and I, we became member, or members and, and Rabbi Grohlman was the principal rabbi, I think the only rabbi, the principal rabbi there, he was a strong civil rights leader in his own name, that's for sure. So we were members, not uh, devoted members, but uh, regular members. And do you remember like what the, what the congregation was like at that time? Were members fairly liberal? I wouldn't say particularly. The congregation was located on Skeeter, where your historical building is right now, as you know. That's where your archives are, et cetera. So it was a big uh, congregation. It was, it was, well, I think you mentioned you're a CRC member. Uh, and I was, we were one of the founders of CRC. So I, anyway, uh, it wasn't particularly liberal, but the rabbi was liberal, and it was, you know, a mainstream reform congregation. So in the next clip we're going to watch, uh, Ben discusses the Liberal Forum, which was the lecture series put on by the JCCA, uh, of which this speech was a part. 
The Liberal Forum rivaled university-sponsored lecture series for prestige in St. Louis. Past speakers included Richard Wright, Margaret Sanger, Thomas Mann, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And the St. Louis Post-Dispatch described the series writing, quote, no other lecture or discussion series regularly provides for the intellectual life of St. Louis, the type of personal stimulation which the Liberal Forum furnishes. Liberal Forum was a big deal. You can, I'm sure you can do some history on the Liberal Forum, but it indeed was a Liberal Forum. And this was before television. It wasn't before television, but it was, it was something that people went to big time because they had a whole range of good, important national speakers. Martin Luther King, in this context, was just one. I can't, can't bring to mind, but they had some outstanding. Liberal Forum was the go-to uh, important event of a Sunday evening, or they would have their speakers. So in the next clip, Ben talks about the buzz that this visit generated. And he also mentions Bill Kahn, who was the executive director of the JCC from 1955 to 1978. Bill Kahn was another person who was instrumental in bringing Dr. King to St. Louis and was also involved in the civil rights movement himself. In 1963, when the JCC began to build the new Jewish Community Center um, in West County, uh, Khan insisted that it be racially integrated with membership open to everyone. And he also marched with King, with Dr. King from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. I was reading some of the history that you sent to me, how Bill Khan helped to get him and Reverend Roman and others. But the thing and who were got out that he was coming and big over such a big demand to hear him and see him, but they moved it to uh, United Hebrew, which held so many people in the auditorium. So in the next clip, I asked Ben if he remembers there being any opposition to Dr. King's visit. There was any opposition to him coming to speak? Well, no, but I imagine there probably was because he was a uh, controversial, electrifying figure. Look what tragically happened to him. Uh, he, was, he was causing change by his nonviolent actions and the nonviolent actions of his, of his uh, followers. And uh, he was a hated person by some people. But, uh, you know, Johnson had a love-hate relationship with Martin Luther King, President Johnson. So, yeah, I'm sure his coming was controversial, but huge turnout, everybody. I mean, liberal Judaism and liberal people. That, that speech, by the way, on November 27, 1960, was attended not just by Jewish congregation, but by anybody who could get a ticket wanted to come. I don't recall, though, there being any uh, security going through the doors or anything like that. I may be wrong, but I don't recall that at all. In the next clip that we're going to watch, uh, Ben speaks about what it was like to be in the audience during this speech that was titled The Future of Integration. He again also mentions the number of people that attended. Um, the speech had to be moved from the Young Men's Hebrew Association, which was at Union Boulevard and Enright Avenue, and relocated to United Hebrew Temple to accommodate the number of people that wanted to attend. Any kind of like crowd control measures or something? I read that there was like, 2,500 people. The place was packed, jam-packed, 
and I was fortunate to get a seat on the side. I had a seat on the side. I mean, at the main and two. So I had a seat on the side, but really up, uh, up front. And I don't remember jumping to his speech or something. I don't remember his speech as such, other than to say it was on civil rights and the movement and we shall overcome. Uh, but it was mesmerizing in the sense of his eloquence. He just captured, you know, he had, he was a speaker. He was, and he talked ex, ex, ex he talked off the cuff. He had some notes, but it wasn't a canned speech to my memory. He reached out to the audience and it started, started slowly. He kept getting better and better and better. He spoke for some length of time. And I think there were questions at the end, but um, the speech was the thing. The speech was, was the thing. In the next clip, I asked Ben what he thought the impact of the speech was on St. Louis as a whole. The question is, how do you think this event kind of impacted the, the broader Well, certainly everybody who was there felt like me that it was a magnificent speech. And I'm sure everybody who was there said, I want to try to do better. We all fall by the wayside as time goes on. But it was a plus for St. Louis, small plus. You know, you got to keep on these things day in, day out, day in, day out. But um, it was a plus. In the next clip, uh, Ben remembers hearing about Dr. King's assassination and how St. Louisans reacted to this news. I mean, the man was, he was exceptional. Do you remember um, the day that he was assassinated? Yes, vividly. Vividly, it was terrifying. Terrifying knowledge of that event. That was, he was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Jack Kennedy was assassinated. As somebody said, uh, guns and America are one and the same almost in that sense. Uh, yes, I do remember to answer your question. Yeah, I wonder. Like, but he was he after after his accession. There was a march, uh, a peaceful march. Uh, other other cities uh, ignited. A St. Louis stayed a civil, but there was a long march which we participated. March of respect. So in the next and final clip, we are just wrapping up and saying our goodbyes to each other. And I want to take just a second now to thank Ben for sharing his time and his story with us. I think he's in the audience here. So hello, Ben, if you're watching, thank you. Um, thank you for helping us to reflect on Dr. King and his legacy today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Take you so care. much. I'll let you go back to the porch now. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julia, for bringing Ben's stories to us today. Next, we have a recording of Reverend Dr. Dr. Anthony Witherspoon of Washington Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church speaking from the reading room at the MHS Library and Research Center. And he's sharing his thoughts on the significance of this year's MLK's theme, the beloved community. The theme of the 2021 King holiday observance is the urgency of creating the beloved community. Even today in 2021, we gather 
to create an urgency of a beloved community and what that community would look like. I'd like to reference a speech that Dr. King rendered in 1967 at the Barrett Junior High School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Ironically, the speech was rendered just six months before he was assassinated. And so now there are several who were at that sighting, who were at that speech, who credit a lot of their success from the speech that was delivered on that day. These are the words of Dr. King. I want to ask you a question, and that is, what is your life's blueprint? Whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint, and that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, and as a building is not well erected without a good, solid blueprint. Now, each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives, and the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. I want to suggest some of the things that should begin your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your own somebodyness. Don't allow anyone or anybody to make you feel that you're nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and always feel that your life is ultimate success has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have the basic principle of determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days, as the years unfold, what you will do in your life and what your life's work will be. Set out to do it and do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, doors are opening to you doors of opportunities that were not open to your mothers and fathers, and the great challenge facing you is to be ready to face these doors as they open. And when you discover what you will do in your life, set out to do it as if God Almighty himself called you at the particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do a great job. Set out to do a job that you will be pleased with and that your parents will be pleased with and the almighty God as well. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera, sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry, sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth we have to pause and say here live the great great street sweeper who swept his job well if you can't be a pine at the top of the hill be a shrub in the valley but be the best little shrub on the side of the hill be a bush if you can't be a tree if you can't be a highway just be a trail if you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail, but the best of whatever you are. I think these words are quite poignant, quite integral in the life of the beloved community. The beloved community exists only when there is purpose, only when there is unity, only when there is love. And the acceptance of all people, regardless of race, creed, regardless of gender and ethnicity, the beloved community exists because love is at the center. And love at the center of the beloved community reminds us that each of us has been called to do different things, to serve in different roles. But regardless of what we have been called to do as a melting pot, Jesus has shown us that all can love if we love sincerely and we love genuinely. I think Dr. King reminds us even today that when we talk about a beloved community, because we have been called out and set apart at such a time as this, we cannot wait on the world to speak for us. We speak for the world. We cannot wait on the world to change the world. We are agents of change for the world. 
And because we have been called by Almighty God, we have been anointed to do so and to remember that in this beloved community, all have come as a result of the triune God. Thank you. As we move to the end of our program, we've invited two very special leaders from our local faith communities to speak with us about the legacy of Dr. King's work today. First, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Koach Baruch Frazier, who is currently a rabbinical student at Reconstructionist Rabbinical College and has been a long time racial justice and activist uh, proponent in the St. Louis area and nationally. Dr. Frazier. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. This week, we are in Parsha Bo in the book of Exodus. The Egyptians have just experienced the sixth plague, the plague of hail, which included fire that came from the heavens. And now the plagues of locusts, of darkness, and the killing of the firstborn are quickly approaching. And right before the last plague, our story appears to be interrupted. God speaks to Moshe and Aaron and gives the instructions regarding the ritual that will memorialize the children of Israel's redemption. We learn that this will be a seven day festival that includes eating unleavened bread and roasted lamb. And we also learn that the first and the last day of this festival are holy convocations and one should not work. And when we get these words and then we get these words from Moshe in chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. It shall be when you come to the land that Hashem will give you as Hashem spoke, you shall observe this service. It will be when your children will say to you, what is this service to you? You shall say, it is the Paschal offering to Hashem who passed over the houses of the children of Israel and Egypt when Hashem struck Egypt and our households Hashem saved. Now, there are a couple of striking things in these passages. One is that this service, these rituals they are learning about now will be observed after redemption has come and they get into the land. This is prophetic. Moshe is instructing them to memorize, memorialize something that hasn't even happened yet. And the second striking thing to me is that Moshe mentions that the children who will be with them in the land who have not experienced this redemption themselves are gonna be asking about these rituals. Where did they come from? And this too is prophetic while simultaneously giving hope that there is in fact life filled with family and curiosity on the other side of enslavement and oppression. And I feel like at this prophetic moment in the text, we can pause and ask ourselves, particularly in this time of global pandemic, alongside this country's political and spiritual reckoning, what is the service? What is the ritual? What is the practice that memorializes our resilience and fortitude in the face of racial capitalism and white Christian nationalism? And I think that Dr. King's beloved community is a service we can look to. Born out of a time in which the United States was undergoing a similar reckoning, King's beloved community is one where all are tolerated, where racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice are replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of siblinghood. International disputes are resolved by peaceful conflict resolution and reconciliation of adversaries instead of military power. Dr. King envisioned that the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. And I believe that this prophetic vision hasn't and cannot come to fruition if we aren't putting its principles into practice. In order to live in a world without what Dr. King called the triple threat, poverty, racism, and militarism, we have to do the hard inward facing work alongside our outward facing work. So what are the inward facing practices that end in reconciliation and redemption? I believe we can turn to laws of teshuva laid out by Maimonides, a medieval rabbi and philosopher 
in the Mishnah Torah. Teshuva means to turn or return. And in this case, I believe it's turning or returning to our best selves. Now, Maimonides says that there are six steps to practice to this practice of return, of which reconciliation is the next to last step. You see, in Jewish tradition, reconciliation can only come after there has been recognition and renunciation of the harm that has been done and reparations have been made. And all of this can't happen unless the harm ceases. You can't just say, I'm sorry, all the while continuing to perpetuate harm and expect that your work is done and all is forgiven. This practice of teshuva is a process of transformation that must be done in community. The renunciation of the harm is done in front of a community of accountability and reconciliation is an ongoing process between the person harmed, the community, and the one who committed the harm. We know we've reached the end of the teshuva process when someone is faced with the same situation, one in which they could inflict harm, and they choose to act differently. This practice of getting clear about when we, when we harm and how we're harming each other and what we are doing to get in right relationship with each other can help sustain the beloved community we so desperately need. And now is the time in the experience of our own plagues for us to be practicing the turning and returning to our best selves. And I believe that if we follow the teshuva process, recognition, renunciation, reparations, reconciliation and return, we have the chance of creating the beloved community that Dr. King spoke of. We can then live authentically in relationship with each other, knowing that we are accountable to one another. And then in lieu of throwing anyone away, we as a community can support their transformation, thereby living into Dr. King's vision of shared abundance, peace, and well-being. And so as we move towards that day, when the beloved community is actualized, I leave you with a blessing. Beruchah at Shechina Elotenu Ruach HaOlam. A blessing you are, Shechina, to this universe, giving breath and wind and spirit to the God within us. May this breath that flows through the lungs of the earth infuse our bodies, allowing the rage, the grief, and anxiety, the joy, the delight, and excitement to flow through us without impediment, letting us feel it but not getting stuck. May this wind of transformation that is sweeping through the universe right now, blow through the trees, through the halls of government and the clouds of Zoom, creating space for the reckoning that must come. And may the spirit of truth and justice that lives within us find the courage to cry out, shaky voice and all, to join the chorus of our siblings throughout the world. Blessed are you, Shekhinah, who gives us the spaciousness to inhale and exhale our way to liberation. Amen. May it be so. Yashar Koach, Dr. Frazier. Uh, may your strength be so. Our last speaker is Reverend Gabrielle Kennedy pastor of Buren Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church and director of Faith and for the Sake of All, an organization whose mission it is to improve the health and well-being of African Americans in St. Louis by mobilizing the faithful. Reverend Kennedy. Amen. Thank you, uh, Alyssa. Uh, what a joy it is to be uh, with you all today. And we thank God uh, for what, this, for, for what a time we've had today in this commemoration. As we prepare to, to close today, remembering the birth of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I'm reminded that he left such an indelible mark on us because he gave voice to our yearnings to overcome despair. And his voice was so resolute that Dr. King continues to speak to us 
in times like these. And as we look down the annals of history, there are no voices that compare to Dr. King. Uh, there are none who hold the eloquence and the mastery with an assuredness and unmistakable gift to express the urgency of the hour. And in this brilliant ability that comes shining through, particularly in his final address to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1967, uh, he delivers an address called, Where Do We Go From Here? This address uplifts the lofty principles of love and power, but also applies them to some practical elements like guaranteed annual income connected with a dignified day's work for poverty-stricken neighbors uh, who were mostly uh, Black bodies in these neighborhoods. Many Black neighborhoods today still bear that burden where disproportionate unemployment, poor education, poor health, and premature death are not only suspected of being in those places, but expected. Where in an era of coronavirus, black and brown bodies are experiencing uh, rates of 30 to 40% of contraction, hospitalization, and death far above their of the population. Friends, just as it was in the civil rights movement, in times, like these, we need a voice, a voice of inspiration, assurance, and love that rings true to pull us back from the edges of despair, a voice that clears the way for a glimmer of hope that seems so far away. And although Dr. Kennedy can't be here with us physically today, the spirit of his intention remains, and his voice has stood the test of time. His voice endures even as we attempt to recover from a continuous onslaught of hate mongering in our society. His voice endures as we fight against the degrading persistent existence of structural racism and its power to dehumanize not just the oppressed, but the oppressor. Dr. King's voice endures even after what we saw at the Capitol, which was not just the result of a speech or even the overbearing rhetoric of hatred and division from the highest offices of the land, but from years of condoning white supremacy in this country. Dr. King's voice endures as we recognize the unusual uptick in anti-Semitic and racially motivated hate crimes, including the church burnings of the last 30 days. And so in the face of all of this, we recommit ourselves to creating a beloved community. The theme is good for this year because it's an opportunity for us to recommit ourselves. Let us not despair uh, to take, uh, uh, allow despair to take a hold of us and lead to misery and anguish, driving us farther away from the vision of beloved community. Uh, in times like these, we cannot celebrate the life of Dr. King without calling out the hatred that is running rampant in this country and that he gave his life to overcome. We must not skip the step of reconcilia reconciliation, Dr. KB, without fully exploring truth. And, and, and the truth telling of Dr. King's enduring voice reminds us that we must never give up on our pledge to create beloved community. Friends, as we lead both moral and faith communities today, let us remember the voice in the wilderness that not only called us to love, but called us to accountability because one without the other is useless. You may be familiar with that address in 1967 that Dr. King made, where do we go from here? Among other things, he laid out a brilliant summary of a program called Operation Breadbasket, which was designed to improve the lives and the livelihoods of black Americans. 
if you listen closely, you'll realize that, that it was the predecessor to many of the programs we see today, except, except it did not assume that the people were powerless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, instead, it made use of what we would now call asset-based community development thing and leveraging what we have to get what we need. Even in 1967, when we didn't have much, uh, it didn't matter how little we had. If we all just brought it together, all of our little bit, we could use it to leverage it and get what we needed. Yet this resulted in bank deposits, jobs, housing, and many other things. But, but Dr. King uh, and his cadre of leaders, because he didn't do it by himself, uh, they brought all of these programs together to leverage what little we had. But even they didn't do it alone. It took relationships. Yeah. And in addition to relationships, it took a deep understanding of love and power. Now, I know we think of Dr. King, uh, in what some might see as the whitewashed, sanitized version that we've often been fed since 1986, the word power may not come to mind. Uh, in fact, it may make some folks uncomfortable, uh, but power is inseparable from love. The uh, love without power is what Dr. King called uh, emotional nonsense. You see, Dr. King believed that love is divine uh, and able to do more than most of us could ever imagine. He believed that love could overcome a broken world and redeem the soul of a nation, bringing about a hope that would fuel us towards this beloved community, where we are transformed into a people who are not just concerned about what we should do, but who are concerned about who we are to become. In times like these, we need to be concerned about who we are to become. And that though, every, and though we are pressed on every side, we will not give up our hope of who we are to become. And as Dr. King said, we will use our voices. And as Dr. King did, use our voices to enact a demanding love. Beloved, as long as we are people of morals and faith in a broken world, the struggle remains. But as long as the struggle remains, there is hope for what we can become. And as long as God's people live in a broken world, we have this hope of overcoming it through the power of love. <laughs> a love so divine that it would reveal itself to the likes of an enslaved, downtrodden people in a place that some called Egypt, yes, and some called America, where it was expected that the gods would only listen to the kings, come on, and that uh, your body would be used uh, and be consumed as a commodity. Uh, but thanks be to God, we have overcome uh, that evil. And, and as we prepare uh, to finish this commemoration, on today, I invite you to consider who you are to become in times like these. We were not just to accept a love from God that gives us, uh, that God gives us, but we were to accept it so that we might share it with one another. Uh, but let us share a love, as Dr. King said, uh, that is not anemic. Yeah, uh, but let us share a love uh, that is a strong, demanding love, a love that has the power to implement justice in the face of tyranny and power that is never implemented without love because without it, power is reckless and abusive and we got enough of that today. Some of you may be less familiar with this 1967 uh, King. Uh, and maybe more familiar with the 1963 I Have a Dream King. But I submit today that they are one and the same. 
on hindsight, we can see that he was being transformed by God's love in such a way that we are sure that it was not just emotional nonsense, but a demanding love. A love that demands that every human being has its basic needs met and that demands that we consider who we are to become, even if it means using our voice and risking what we have in the name of others. But the question is today, friend, will we be those who say we love our neighbor and do good deeds without a demanding love? Or will we be transformed into a beloved community, risking what we have to exercise our power in love where we live, where we work, where we worship, where we socialize, and where we spend our money. Yes, I know. It seems like this might be too big for us. But friends, I encourage you on today. Do not despair. Let us not despair and lose hope. But let us do it together. Let us do it in community. And so I thank God that on today, as we commemorate Dr. King and his work, as we commemorate the day of his birth, that we can declare that hope is not lost as we are creating and recommit to creating beloved community. Hope is not lost. And let us declare that divine love demanding justice is in order in times like these. Amen. Amen, Reverend Kennedy. It was a true honor to be joined by so many excellent speakers and incredibly inspirational leaders in our community, especially those who are continuing to work on equity in our city, region, and nation. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please stay healthy, happy, and safe in this new year.